My name is Eric Wessoff. I'm the editor-in-chief at Green Tech Media. Green Tech Media is an integrated news and research company uh, that covers alternative energy and green technology. We're here today with Brian Rich, the Senior Director of Customer and Demand Side Technologies at PG&E. And we're also here with Neil Gadre, who is the VP of Products at Silver Spring Networks. We're here to discuss the smart grid and the value of standards in the smart grid and uh, our intention is to make the occasionally prosaic topic of standards um, thrilling and scintillating. So that's the pressure you have today, is to, is to make that, that topic um, uh, thrilling. You know, when the consumer thinks about the smart grid, th what they typically think of is a smart meter, perhaps. But that's, it's, it's something far different from uh, the role of a a vendor or the role of, uh, of a utility. Even the DOE, most of their funding went to, initially went to smart meters. So um, I, I, certainly the smart grid is something far more different than, than just smart meters. And so I'd like you to talk about what PG&E views the smart grid to be and what it looks like to them. And Anil, I'd like you to talk also what you what you envision the, the smart grid to be. And bef before you get into that, you know, um, John Dewar, a, a venture capitalist, saw the smart grid as the, the last great network we're ever going to build in our lifetimes. And it's easy to take these high level approaches to what the smart grid is, but you gentlemen are tasked with actually building the thing. And so it's, it's very important to understand what the utilities, and vendors view the smart grid to be. So, so Brian, tell us from your viewpoint as one of the pioneers in, in the smart grid um, and one of the pioneers as a utility in renewable energy, what your perception and vision of the smart grid is. Sure, pg e definitely has a perspective that the smart grid is much broader than just smart meters. We think look at smart meters as a foundation and a first foray into the smart grid. But if you look at some of the inherent challenges we have in California, we're a supply constrained state. We have a strong commitment to renewables, a lot of distributed generation in our territory. I believe 40% of the of the solar rooftop generation in the state, in the, in the country is in pg and territory. Emerging um, electric vehicles, uh, we knew that we had to make a pretty quick jump into the smart grid. So clearly we see it as the changing of the supply and demand curve in the energy market, much broader than smart meter. Um, smart meter was our initial deployment into it. Definitely look at it as the analogy of the smart meter being the iPhone and then the coming, coming waves of it being the actual app store. Okay. Or the network being the iPhone itself, right? And Even better, yeah. Okay. Okay. And Anil? Well, I mean, I think the leading edge adopters really had a very expansive view beyond the first implementation. So when we think of a smart grid, we actually think about a vast sensor network. And underlying that concept is the choice of many of the technologies because this was a scale, ultimately, that was perhaps even bigger than the internet that we think about today in kind of the classic consumer or, or the enterprise world. So those, those kinds of things weren't about just one application. The entire you know, foundation was about multiple applications and bringing together uh, disparate parts of a utility that have never before actually had to work together. So I think uh, you know, PG&E is an excellent example of you know, where innovation and, and leaders um, thought about, hey, where are we going to go over the long period of time? And I think the distributed generation point is a particular interesting one because it completely changes the, the, what the grid and what the foundational technologies have to, be, have to allow them to do. Uh, you know, I've, I've spoken to a number of utility folks who are somewhat insulted by the, the term smart grid as being new. They feel that there's intelligence in the grid already, but maybe it wasn't interconnected. And that's what I think the coming age of the smart grid is interconnecting these sensors and these new applications. And the new applications include the distributed generation, whether it be solar or wind or energy storage, distribution automation, and other applications and other pieces of hardware that all have to communicate with each other. And instead of having a Tower of Babel, it's the standards that are going to enable all of these vendors and all of this hardware to interoperate. And, and I, I think that's the, one of the gists of 
the importance of standards of communication protocols and what we're trying to bring forth in this conversation. So let's keep coming back to the crucial nature of standards. So Brian, tell us a little bit about some of the projects. You're essentially the divisional CIO, the chief information officer, dealing with PG&E, every customer from the meter inwards, right, into the home. So there are other applications, but this is your specialty. Tell us a little bit about some of the customer-focused, customer-facing applications that you're working on within the smart grid. Great, and I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I think if you could look at a smart meter deployment and it turns very tactical and very deployment focused very quickly. But what we've learned clearly is that the benefit of a smart meter deployment is to bring your customers through that change. So giving them access to real-time energy to be able to inform and make their decisions, enabling more and more customers to participate in demand-side management programs such as energy efficiency, demand response, um, being able to automate uh, outage detection, size and scoping of outages, being able to give customers more real-time information around what's going on with an outage. So clearly connecting that very tactical uh, deployment exercise coupled with the size and scale of a utility like PG&E where we're actually really having to exponentially scale all of our technologies but also bring our customers along for both the operational customer experience benefits, their ability to engage in the energy market, including participating in a vast portfolio of new programs around energy efficiency, demand response, and a new portfolio of pricing programs as well. It's been that entire umbrella of initiatives for pg and &E. So it's obviously a lot more than just a, um, a billing tool. Correct. Right? So can you talk a little bit about some uh, standardization and things that you've encountered, lessons learned, as you've been a pioneer in the deployment of meters, um, the, where standardization worked and standardization didn't work. pg and &E was, was quick to jump into the smart meter deployment, um, and there were a lot of external trends why California energy crisis, as I mentioned earlier, the amount of distributed generation we have in our territory, the supply constraints we have, our commitments to renewables, we, we jumped quickly in. Uh, at the time we moved into the smart meter deployment, power line carrier really was becoming emerging as a standard. Uh, we quickly learned early in our deployment that that wasn't going to work, um, and I think most of North America has coalesced around that decision. So we really got uh, interested in what Silver Spring was drumming up around having more of an IP-based network. Uh, one thing we clearly knew from the start of our smart meter deployment, and it really has panned out, is that we had no, in, no we never contemplated being somebody, uh, a utility who was going to work inside the meter for our customers. What we wanted to do was create an ecosystem and a platform for our customers to have choice and control of what they might want to do on either automating their home or consuming their data and pushing it out to an ecosystem of other platforms for them to be able to make real-time decisions. So we felt that our responsibility as the utility was to create that foundation that gave our customers the choice and control. Uh, moving to the, the upgraded version of our smart meter technology that, uh, that Silver Spring offered us really gave us that interoperability to be able to turn to our customers and, and really offer them the choice of control that really, we really wanted and also be able to have the utility be perceived and also act in the market as an enabler. You know, it's so funny to hear you talk about choice and control that you're trying to provide to your end consumer, whether it's a home or a business because th there's such a terrific parallel with how we think about what we're trying to do for the utility, which is actually to bring choice and control and put it in your hands, right? So the whole point of, you know, wh why do standards matter? Well, they matter because they allow a degree of plug and play interoperability, which actually creates more choice, right? There's no lock-in because, because you have multiple partners that you can add on to. And, and the only way we're really gonna get leverage long-term in this business is, is by creating the ability for multiple solutions to show up, multiple uh, partners who make in-home devices or whether it's refrigerators or, or you know, more complicated things, right? Air conditioners, PV inverters and so on. All of that is going to, the innovation is going to be driven by choice and the, 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 the right foundation really matters, right? The right standards matter because if you, if you don't get those foundational elements right, you can't actually wind up in a place where you got choice and control. Sure, and, and PG&E is making decisions that have 20-year implications. You don't, you can't switch out a smart meter like you would an iPhone. It's, that's a 20-year, a 25-year commitment, mm -hmm. and you had better know, it had better be able to grow with the network 
to unforeseen places. Brian mentioned moving to I, an IP solution instead of a power line carrier. Can you talk a little bit about, I mean, this is the genesis of Silver Spring Network is, is their IP foundation. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, going back to the founding vision, uh, there were a couple of fundamentals. One was, hey, a, a bunch of really interesting things happened in the telecommunications industry and the, the classic kind of internet computer industry, right, and software industry. How could those things be leveraged? Because the point of it wasn't to sort of just drag those technologies over to a new industry. It was to take literally billions of dollars worth of investment and several decades worth of proving it out and saying, well, how could you leverage that in a whole new industry? And so that's when, you know, th then you couple in the unique needs of the, this business, the energy business, which is vast scale. If you think about the number of different kinds of sensors that are going to need to be on the grid long term, you have to sort of plan for addressability. You have to have a very different kind of security. So that's how you get to IPv6 as a foundational element. And from there, what starts happening is the realization that, you know, today we all take Wi-Fi for granted, right? Well, that is the physical connection between my phone or my laptop in, you know, whatever building we're sitting in. Well, the same kind of thing needed to happen with the new generation of devices that were going to show up. So, so lobbying for, driving for, creating, uh, bringing different kinds of partners together to create the, the 802.15 4G standard, which is the physical standard, right? It's, it's akin to Wi-Fi. But it's for these kinds of devices that are going to be in a very different place. It's the RF mesh it's protocol, the RF, yes? it's, it's, it's what makes you have plug and play at that physical level to join the network, just like you and I join Wi-Fi. So I want to return to the, the sausage making of standards uh, in a little while in, in this dialogue. But Brian, I want to come back to projects. So you, you spoke a little bit about meter rollout. What other consumer facing um, deployments are happening at PG&E? Um, earlier, we talked a little bit about green button or um, pilots in home area networks and, and energy dashboards. Can you talk a little bit about your, act, your activity there, what you're doing? And again, uh, put it in the perspective of the standards, the, cru the crucial nature of standards. In Absolutely. And, and of course, there is no better example when you think about the customer facing technology of smart, of smart meter and smart grid than the green button. And PG&E is really proud to have been one of the California utilities to really, really start that process. And it's a classic example of where we were getting this diluge of interval data back into our warehouse. And we felt very strongly from the outset that our consumers shouldn't be inhibited by the utility's pace at innovation. But we should be able to create this ecosystem of getting our data out in a very secure fashion for our customers, for them to be able to turn to an ecosystem of other types of developers who might be able to create niche, niche scenarios for them to manage their energy. So could you um, maybe just backtrack a little and tell us what the green button Absolutely. actually is? So the green button evolved from a standard, um, and, and very applicable to this conversation, called OpenADE, which is Automated Data Exchange. And really what the standard was was an evolving format of how you would actually push interval data out um, externally. Now there's a, a lot of use cases, some of which are for more consumerization of being able to manage your energy, some are more in the demand response phase of being able to do settlements on the back end of DR events. But if you really focus at what Green Button was, it was taking that op open ADE standard and and pushing it out through, a cut, through our, our secure web portal for customers for them to be able to manually download their data and then push it out. It's really what we, if you think about the crawl, walk, run um, analogy, Green button is really the first step in what really should ultimately become a machine-to-machine -machine data exchange of this data. So green button, we felt, was really a market facilitator of being able to get this, th this ecosystem set up, and we're really proud to have done it. Um, what we see coming in the future is the real full-blown full standard of the open ADE standard, which is really more machine-to-machine. -machine. And then you start thinking of what a lot of consumers know in their life of the mint.com model, where you're basically setting up that interchange, and then it, and then it happens on some repeated basis. Okay, so it wouldn't it wouldn't be something that was that application developers could work with if it didn't have um, a, f a 
firm standard in the in the the ADE standard in, in place. That's correct. The worst thing that could have happened was for us to push our data out into the marketplace, and then our our peer utilities in California to push it out in different formats, and then even worse, the rest of the the country all throwing it out in different formats. So we quickly coalesced around around that standard and making sure that any utility in the country that's de that's deploying Green Button is doing it with the same standard. Our developer community is now prospering and, and building a lot of different tools. As, as the a result origin of, it. of the Green Button was originally, I, I think. A, it was in, used in healthcare. There right? was a blue, blue button. Blue yes, button. there was a blue okay. button in healthcare, okay. and it was replicated into um, yeah. into the utility market. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and and lastly, while we're covering the projects, I, I think it's still pilot stage and very early days in um, home area networks, home energy networks, and energy dashboards. But can you talk a little bit about PG&E's rollout as uh, or pilot programs on that, as well as the riddle of standardization in that in that hardware absolutely so we, we did we did begin our pilot rollout um, uh, earlier this year um, or originally with some uh, employees just to get some initial feedback on how the technology was working and then we're beginning to broaden it out to a larger scale um, we've really kind of for the first phase locked people through with a very high touch home in home installation of the device to make sure it connects to the meter but we definitely see the end in sight which could be a potential retail model where customers are going out to uh, a Best Buy or some other store, and then plugging it home, doing self self uh, authentication of the meter, self provisioning, um, and being able to authenticate to the meter. So again, in that crawl, walk, run analogy, we started very very quickly with some employees. We certified one device on our network, and then over the coming years, we'll be certified. Over the coming months, we'll be certifying more devices and beginning to roll out to, to more and more customers. And is the standard being used? Is is it the? Uh, it's it's typically a, a, a species of Zig uh, of Zigbee. It's the SCP 2.0? Uh, right now we're on the, we've deployed on the SCP 1.0 standard, um, but we definitely are working with all of our partners to continue to evolve that standard where we see SCP 2.0 really being where the interoperability with the standard really happens. Yeah, and, uh, and by the way, sorry. We're oh. dependent on partners like Smart Lake, like Silver Springs to be able to work with us and, and move to that standard. No, this is a great example of uh, the DOE has a grant that they're funding with uh, Hawaii uh, in Maui where they're trying to sort of prove out all, all, everything at once, right? Distributed generation, uh, demand response, smarter engagement of consumers. And so I bring it up because this is a great example of how uh, we are actually working with them to further the actual implementation of the SEP 2.0 spec to turn it into real code, try it out, get real time in the game with, you know, how is it working and how efficient it is. And then once that, so this is a great example of, you know, there's an idea, there's a specification, someone's got to go write code and make it happen. And then suddenly you, you start seeing a blossoming of the ecosystem because that's the great leverage point, right? There's data, there's, there's sort of a, I know how to make it plug and play, and you can let people innovate on top of that. And, and Silver Spring is involved in that Maui uh, Very much, yeah. de demo project, right? And um, it, since it's Hawaii and it involves solar, um, and there is a, there's a solar component. If solar is going to be an integrated part of the grid, there has to be a communication protocol for the solar installation to actually communicate with the grid and, and inform it of what its status is. And I think that's called uh, SunSpec. Is, is that one of the standards? Su SunSpec is a broader standard around renewables in general. But I, th I think you're actually uh, you know, uh, heading into a different place, which is, that is a, this is a great example of how what historically were very different silos inside a utility, right? There was the, the crowd who collected data to send you a bill. There was a the crowd who worried about grid reliability, the distribution automation crowd, and the folks who were you know, increasingly interested in time of use pricing, incentives, demand response. So what's, what now is obvious is that you can't do any of those unless they all work together. And that, that perhaps is the, the single best reason for why those silos have to dissolve and standards actually enable that crosstalk and cross fertilization inside inside the utility itself. And, and maybe Brian can speak more to that because you cannot do incentive pricing if you don't have granular enough data. You can't actually have demand response programs. You can't manage grid stability if if you're looking at you know photovoltaics in a silo. So I think this is this is probably the the best. Uh, and and we're in PG&E is a great place to sort of experience all those issues because of all the different initiatives right. and uh, 
and the unique place we're in, right? I love to hear Anil talk about it because it, it really is true that, that Smart Grid forces the utility to break down those barriers. Mm -hmm. you, we talk all the time about bringing our customers along for the change, but the change management within the utility is pretty significant. So, you know, a quick use case to talk about would be a demand response event. You can have ha a bunch of people focused on getting customers to curb demand during a peak event. But until your procurement folks actually see that as a supply side resource, until your T&D folks actually see that as a way to, to manage reliability and manage assets during, it doesn't, you don't really unlock the value of a concept of demand response. You continue to operate in silos. So it's really a, an excellent conversation to go into around change management within the utility. Great. So, and, and, you know, just to peel the onion on that one, because you use the magic words, which is you, you look at demand response actually as a generator, right? Now, so, so suddenly, that's a great thought. But it means that at an operational level, you have, to be, you have to be very confident in how much demand can be shed and how much can you generate by shedding, right? So precision, speed, all those sorts of things suddenly show up uh, as being incredibly relevant to the mission critical sort of day-to-day, minute-by-minute operation of the grid and its stability. And I think this is where the, the, the natural foundation that IPv6 and a standardized uh, foundation lets you actually make those different applications that sort of get integrated uh, along the way. So I think it's a, a, a great point that not only are open standards um, creating interoperability at the hardware level and changing the consumer experience, but they're actually transforming the internal nature of the culture of the utilities themselves, which is um, a seismic can, can, could be considered a, a, a seismic shift in, in the way utilities work and breaking down those silos. So it's easy to think about standards as just being interoperability between a Wi-Fi device and a, and a meter, but it, to see its implications in the structural basis of the way, you, the structural nature of the way utilities work is a pretty big change that we're seeing. Well, and, and you know, one thing that's going to happen naturally is we, we're going to keep sort of working our way up that stack. So we got. We had the middle, sort of last five years, the bottom became standardized. The, the top, from a, from a data interchange standpoint, there were things called C1219 for how, how meters measure stuff and DLMS, COSM, outside the US. There are web services standards. There are more standards in the SIM space. And those are the, going to be now the, the increasingly interesting ones as we keep moving up the stack because you know I think the, the end game here is how do, you, how do you make applications connect to each other? Because, you know, just like Wi-Fi, you know you can get on the network. You can get these devices on there and make that reasonably easy. The hard, now, now, now let's focus on the stuff above there. And as I think about that movement of standards up the stack, and I take my, my broader PG&E hat on, off and think about just my, my role with, as a technology professional within the PG&E organization, as I procure software, just like my customers shouldn't be gated by utilities and ability, ability to innovate, I need to be able to select software that can be compliant with anything within my stack. And the standards of interfaces between them is, is so critical, especially when you think of the size and scale of a PG&E and the amount of data we're pumping through those systems. Anil Gadre of Silver Spring Networks and Brian Rich of PG&E, let's formally talk about the thrilling part of standardization and the standards effort and, and, and the sausage making that goes into um, creating this stack of standards. So can you give us, a, uh, in 25 words or less, um, tell us everything you know about uh, standardization and the efforts within Silver Spring Networks to get this done. It's not just IPv6, it's a whole acronym salad and stack of, of standards. Can you tell us a little bit about the loading order, that may be the wrong term, but where you, ha you had to start at the base, of the, at the physical level, but tell us a little bit about how that spawns other standardization and, and just the general crucial nature that within the Silver Spring Network I, I need world. 250 okay, words. Okay, I'll take 20, it. 25 seconds. Okay, well, understood. Well, so the short version is I think uh, Open AMI is a great example that started back in I think 2007 probably, right? And uh, we, we realized as a company that you had to pull together a whole bunch of people to start down this path of, of trying to make it easier and easier to get choice. So multiple meters, uh, all, all being able to connect easily. And by the way, meters was just the first use case, right? It's really the broader concept of sensors. So that, that's actually how 802.15 4G finally happened. And it, it takes a long time because a large number of people around the world 
need to be brought on board, uh, work in a very collegial manner, understanding that this is a common thing, common good we're creating, right? So now that's done. I think other ones that we've been involved in are similar. Uh, open ADR for uh, dem open demand response using the internet, not proprietary networks, for instance. Uh, certainly the SEP and uh, uh, Zigbee work uh, are, are two other examples. Uh, the uh, the SunSpec work that you talked about earlier about you know where are renewables going and what do standards even mean, right? So, I mean, these are, all of these are at different phases, uh, but they probably add up to be about 10 or 12 different efforts that we're involved in uh, on a global basis, uh, trying to look at sort of every layer of the standard stack and more, uh, because some of those aren't really in, in that nice clean layer seven stack, uh, they're sort of related. Um, that's probably 300 words. Are there, uh, that's, uh, that's perfect. So Anil, is there, are there other examples um, outside of the uh, PG&E territory that, that you can give of uh, a standardization effort that resulted in a win? Well, in, so I, I would say there are uh, quite a few uh, that are all, the wins are of different kinds, right? Um, just uh, having meter choice, right? Having device choice, sensor choice, uh, alone changes the dynamics of how a utility is able to think about um, uh, their speed at which they operate, the, the, the cost profile, uh, the business cases. Uh, those, are, those are some very sort of foundational things. Beyond that really is the ability to, uh, as Brian was saying, start breaking down the internal silos and get the different organizations to really think about uh, the end consumer experience differently. Because historically, uh, and OG&E, uh, Oklahoma Gas and Electric is a great example, uh, they early on decided that they were going to be doing demand response and smart grid metering all at one time. Typically, utilities have chosen to kind of, let's do one, then another, then another. So my ex example here is, uh, here's a utility that said, okay, this is going to be the thing that allows us to force a transformation in how we think about the consumer experience. So, you know, that, that's kind of a new thought in this whole space too, which is how do we enable a very different mindset on the part of whether it's a business or a home residential consumer, how we think about either the residential or the business consumer and enable them and empower them because, I, I mean, I think maybe Brian can speak better to this. The ultimate game is to actually put more control in their hands so that they can act in, a, uh, uh, in, in whatever way they choose to, right? Yeah, I think that, I mean, obviously that's our end game. You, you do, you could look at smart meter purely as a tactical operational play. How do you take cost out of the utility by more remote disconnects and, and, and less rolling of trucks and sizing and scoping outages, but it becomes very tactical and you don't bring your customer base for it and you lose the societal benefits and you lose the ability to really operate the utility more effective across the value chain. So um, I really appreciate the way Anil frames it, is being able to bring your customers along for the change, give them that choice of control of what, they might, what actions they might want to take within home automation, what actions they might want to take with their data, but also provide them insights around their energy consumption and provide them options of products, rate plans, whatever it might be for them to be able to really engage in the energy market. So when, when PG&E makes vendor decisions and device decisions from this ecosystem of, of hardware and software that's out there, a standardization in place enables a, t typically a utility would only want to go with a multi-billion dollar multinational company that had been around for a hundred years. But now you can almost entertain the notion of a, a startup with a new product who adheres to the right standards. You can experiment with new pieces of hardware and some new, diff uh, some really fast innovation um, without the risk. Is, is that, does that make sense? I think, yeah, and I think it's a great point. I think, I think that's another kind of change management exercise that the utility is going through, particularly on the technology side. Smart Grid has really kind of changed the, the level of which we're engaging with the vendor community. A lot more startup activity in the space. Um, and it's, it's new for, for the utility who typically have, have dealt with some of the real bigger players, but innovation is happening at such a fast pace we're working with a lot of smaller companies. We're seeing a lot of 
uh, mergers and acquisitions in the industry, and we're following that closely. I would also say smart grid has been really the first time that, that uh, utilities have started to really entertain cloud technology, and we had always been very lagging in that. But you're seeing a lot of innovation happen in the cloud, particularly in energy management. So it's also been, a, a again, back to that word, a change management exercise for the utility on our vendor relationships are different, the size and scale of our vendors are different, the pace at which they either deliver, be it because they're on agile methodology or they deliver out in the cloud, are all changes to us that we're working through. Great. Anil Gadre of Silver Spring Networks and Brian Rich of PG&E. Let's segue and talk a little bit about going forward and move, moving into the future. Again, we, we discussed that there are applications that we haven't foreseen or that are, that are emerging. How do you see your role, uh, your job specifically, um, but where, what, what is the consumer home of the future look like? And again, bring it home if you can a little bit to some standards. Uh, we, we've seen meters and that you've, I think PG&E's deployed five million meters and it, 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 maybe more in its service ter territory. I'm, I'm outdated, it's probably a lot more. Between than gas that. and electric, we've exceeded nine million. Okay, um, but that, that that's going to end at a certain point. What's the next big project? Once you've once you've done AMI and metering, what's the the next thing to look at? For well, one of the exciting things about about um, the next chapter is that first of all, it's not the utility's role to opine of what the home of the home automation of the future looks like. It's our job to really create the the standards, the open automation that our consumers can play at the pace of innovation in third party markets. And act as a referee to yeah. the, to that, yes. A and an enabler. We really do see ourselves as an enabler, but not but so, not somebody who's innovating in the home. So to some extent, we continue to really drive standards with some of our partners like Silver Springs to make sure that we are creating that potential for our customers in the future. Um, but we have a lot more work to do on investment in smart grid. So as we operationalize the smart meter deployment, we move more toward automating our grid, a lot more investment in synchrophaser technology on the transmission side, Felicer schemes and, demand, and uh, DMS systems on the, on the distribution side, um, more and more renewables, virtual power plants coming up. So, so one of the things that's so exciting to me is that I don't see the finish line. Um, and to some extent, that, that deployment layer is now uh, becoming more and more operationalized, and we really get to see the innovation take place. And to your point earlier, the utility really stands back, and our, our role is to force standards and then watch how innovation in the market takes place. Great. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say that, you know, it, there, are, there are utilities who started with distribution automation first. Uh, we have customers who are, they didn't start with, you know, classic, meters, right? And that's an interesting clue to there are a, different approaches to uh, what you can do with the grid. So my, my sort of approach to this is the next big thing is, well, now that you have a grid, let's get more out of it, right? Because it wasn't a one-time uh, endpoint. It was really a foundation, as Brian was just talking about, to enable more interesting things to happen. So I'll give you just a couple of quick examples, right? Outage restoration is a mission critical thing when storms happen, when whatever happens, right? And so for the first time, uh, this is about how do you bring together the, the power of a distributed intelligence sitting inside uh, a sensor uh, that's all over the place, coupled with distribution automation insights into whether it's a, which line might be down or which substation transformer might have a problem, coupled with, you know, how do, how do I now dispatch my fleet to the uh, by the way, to the real outage, not to a false outage, because that, that's what influences time. There are, a second example would be, there are a lot of people starting to look at, you know, voltage optimization. So how do you do, you know, uh, conservation voltage reduction and, and literally save, you know, today people kind of get one and a half to two percent savings on sort of the old way of doing it uh, by modeling uh, what the li end of line voltage should be. Well, now you can actually tell exactly what the voltage was at every premise, every business or home, or, or business, yeah, business and home. So there are, there are ways to potentially double savings without having to do any complicated demand response, consumer engagement programs. You might just be able to do you know, very large amounts of savings from voltage optimization and CVR implementations, which are all demand uh, distribution automation kind of apps, right? So you couple that with now demand response treated as actually a demand gener a generator, right? Distributed uh, generation. And suddenly you start having the makings of some really exciting times, which 
are going to be all enabled because of, uh, you know, you can rely on the standards. You're not, you're not sort of spending time and money trying to stitch things together and hope they work because by definition, the, the architecture was designed for that, that uh, growth over time. Okay, so, I mean, we've heard about how it accelerates innovation, how it accelerates innovation at the customer side, but also within the utility. It is, is, it is almost as exciting as a, a car chase. And thank you for, 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 for getting it to that level. Um, can you offer, since we are talking about standards, can you offer almost a, a cautionary tale of, I mean, we've talked about success stories and wins. Are there examples of proprietary protocols that have resulted in cul-de-sacs and dead ends and, and uh, just, in, you know, we, we've talked about the positive aspect. Can you show a, an example of, perhaps, may, may, maybe not, but is there, is there an example of where you talked a little bit about um, power line communications. Are there other examples or are there holdouts? I mean, there, this is, we're talking about, about standards, but are there, there are certainly people who might hold out against uh, going with a standard or be reluctant to standardization. So what is the, if, if this is um, all about uh, baseball mom and apple pie, what would, what would be the reason for someone not going forth with, with a standard? I don't, I don't know if this is the dark underbelly of, of standardization, but is there a tale of a company not willing to go along with some of the standards efforts that are being made? I, I don't know if it's a single company or anything like that. It may be more, um you know, there, there are special purpose technologies um, in, in the demand autom distribution automation space that, uh, you know, uh, you, you, get a, you get people talking about uh, a certain latency is really critical for a control-oriented application, which has to be extremely fast, right? So um, one of the things that's happening there, uh, much like happened, by the way, with, you know, Wi-Fi and e Ethernet, right? Over time, these things just kept getting faster and faster and faster. And a standard actually was able to deliver what a special purpose thing was, was meant for. So I, I see that kind of uh, more general movement happening here in the space, which is a lot of things that historically people said, no, 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 I got to have my own unique thing because you know, I've got I've to have a certain kind of performance spec around it. Uh, suddenly, it's like, oh. That's interesting that I can actually do that with the, that with the, with the core platform grid anyway, right? So I think that, that there will be a reduction of those unique uh, point solutions uh, that, that are were by definition proprietary. Um, and suddenly people are going to sort of flip over and go, okay, well, if, 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 this is, if this does more than enough of what I need and gives me leverage in other parts of the utility, why wouldn't I, right? All right. So... Um I think for our audience, if they're looking for more details on this and more resources, I know that Silver Spring Networks has a number of white papers on open architectures and, and the standardization process that are available for download on your website. Does PG&E have any um, resources that, that uh, if our audience wants to go a, a little bit deeper, um, that they can avail themselves to? We have materials on www.pg.com. In addition, we are actively engaged in all of the, the broader standards bodies that we're, we're participating as a, as a member. Okay. All right. So, Anil Gadre of Silver Spring Networks and, and Brian Rich of, of PG&E, thank you very much for your time.